give a presentation, uh, which uh, will be followed by a discussion and quite a Q and A kind of Q and A as well um, on civic infrastructure. A little background on Matt: He is the executive director of the Deliberative Democracy Consortium, which is a consortium of more than 50 organizations working in the dialogue and deliberation field. He is the author of *The Next Form of Democracy: How Expert Rules Giving Way to Shared Governance and Why Politics Will Remain the Same*. He's a widely recognized expert on deliberative practices and civic engagement, often covering reports and consulting for organizations such as the International City Management Association, for which he authored recently Planning for a Stronger Local Democracy, a field guide for elected officials. Um, and for nearly the past uh, two decades almost, he's worked on public engagement efforts in over 100 communities, 40 states, and four Canadian provinces. Uh, he lives near Toronto, Canada. We won't hold the behavior of your elected officials oh, yeah. against you. <laughs> Um, from that city. Right. Uh, politicians behave in manly. As long as he doesn't hold them against us. Right, right, right. <laughs> it was like, I was kind of like, yeah, see, they got some in Canada too. <laughs> They're not always great in Canada. Uh, uh, but we won't hold that against them. Uh, let's welcome uh, Matt Lane. Thanks. I promise not to say any bad words. <laughs> um, and thanks, Joe, and Norma, and Thea, and um, everybody, Maria. It's always great to be here. Uh, all the great things that, that are happening in Chicago and at IPSI in particular, um, it, it's fun to be here. I also uh, appreciate the small things that you guys have done, like the little signs in the lobby directing us all to the right room in this huge building. Um, I, however, was a little taken aback by another sign I saw in the lobby which said, um, the Secretary of State is located under the stairs. And I was wondering why you kidnapped the Secretary of State. <laughs> do you do this with all your speakers? <laughs> so, um, my um, way of thinking about uh, civic infrastructure and public participation was shaped a lot by an experience I had a few years ago when I was in a, a town in Colorado called Lakewood. Um, and the reason I was there was that even though the residents of this suburb of Denver said Lakewood was a great place to live, they valued the schools, they valued the services they got from the local government, everything was wonderful, and yet uh, the city budget had gone deeply into the red because nine times in the previous 30 years, residents had voted down sales tax increases meant merely to maintain the same level of services. So the mayor had brought together a bunch of people, neighborhood community leaders, said, you know, what do you want me to do? Um, I can try to raise taxes again, People aren't going to like that. I can cut services, they're not going to like that either. Um, and so in the midst of this meeting, finally somebody said, you know, Steve, Mayor, um, you know, we like you. We, you know, we think you work hard. Um, but what we've had here in the past is a parent-child relationship between government and citizens, and what we need to create is an adult-adult relationship. And that was a nice image for me because it kind of, you know, made me realize what I was seeing in all these other places as well, this kind of dramatic kind of generational shift in what people want, not just out of government, but out of all kinds of public institutions, their school systems, uh, their community foundations, all kinds of, of, of organizations in their community. Uh, and it made me realize that people, you know, that um, are busier than ever. They don't have time to get involved in things. And yet when they do get to the table, they bring more capacity, more skills, more resources that people are in many ways are, are kind of um, feeling more entitled to the protection and services of government and yet less confident that those institutions in their lives are going to be able to deliver. And that people are in many ways less aware of what's happening in their neighborhood um, or in their community, despite all these you know, online connections we have. And yet when they do find an issue or a cause or a problem they care about, they're better able to use those connections to find the resources, the allies, uh, the information they need to make an impact on the issue. So people, I think, generally are, you know, they're better at governing and less willing to be governed than ever before. And that's a huge shift which is driving all of this work and participation um, and, and all these kind of related, related fields. So, um, I think one way in which civic stuff, in which participation, public engagement works is by treating people like adults. 
kind of within the context of, the, of a particular process on an issue, on a particular public decision, usually, or some kind of public issue people are working on, it gives people, first of all, the information that they want and the way that they can absorb it. It gives them a chance to tell their story and participate and kind of understand where each other are coming from. It gives them choices about what they want to see happening. Um, it gives them chances to take action themselves, not simply make recommendations for others. Uh, it gives them legitimacy in the sense that it's giving them a sense that, that they are being heard, uh, both by their kind of peers, their, their neighbors, and also by government in some, some way that's subtle and yet significant. A couple other things that are fairly basic you know, examples of how good participation treats people like adults. First of all, you good process, and I think you know, people talk a lot about you know, elements, various kinds of elements of good process this morning. And then also that it's fun, it's enjoyable, realizing that this isn't just kind of serious, weighty work. Yes, it is, but it's also something that can include food, music, socializing, uh, kids, all the other things that, that make this kind of thing, this kind of work fun. So I'm going to talk mainly about civic infrastructure, which is kind of the capacity of a community to do more of this kind of work, to treat people like adults on a more ongoing basis. But just because, <laughs> Um, something is happening tomorrow that is an example of a new type of, of, of engagement. Just give me a couple of slides here. I want to tell you about the thing that's happening, um, and it's somewhat unusual. Um, it's uh, part of the uh, National Dialogue on Mental Health. It's called Text Talk and Act. It is a national text-enabled face-to-face discussion that's happening all over the country. Um, you can take part if you want. Um, and it's, it's uh, this part of this the ongoing year-long thing called the National Dialogue of Mental Health, uh, which is uh, was launched by, launched by President Obama in June. It's been supported by a bunch of the main kind of organizations in this kind of public engagement um, field. Um, and so what's been happening mainly have been kind of face-to-face -face events in all these different parts of the country. And you can go to creatingcommunitysolutions.org to see this map and see the, the things that are going on. But when we looked at this kind of mid-summer, we kind of felt like, okay, we've got a map here of lots of cool local events that don't feel like a national conversation. They don't feel connected to one another, and they're also not as kind of focused on young people as we would like because the mental health of young people is a big focus of the whole project. So that's kind of where this idea of text talk and act came from. And basically what it is is um, tomorrow, <laughs> everywhere, um, people will be getting together in you know, small groups, you know, four or five people, and all they need is one cell phone that can have, you know, well, they can all use theirs, but they're basically you need only one uh, phone per group. And basically they'll start, they'll text the start to 89800, and, and essentially what they will get back is a whole series of texts. Uh, some of the texts are polling questions, some of them are, are texts are kind of discussion questions. Um, so basically it kind of walks them through, it starts them off with some kind of questions like, you know, why do you care about, uh, uh, or how often do you think about mental health, or do you think mental health is important, very important, not so important, those kinds of things. Some people kind of click in their answers to these kind of polling questions. And then it gives them some discussion questions to talk about in the little group. You know, how, um, why is it difficult to talk about mental health? Um, why is it, uh, how have mental health issues affected you or somebody you know? Kind of using some of the kind of the standard sequence that we often use in public participation work of kind of personal experience and then going on to kind of bigger questions and policy questions. And then as people answer these things, for the polling questions, they can actually see the results instantaneously. You, you get a link to your phone, it takes you a thing which shows you know, how many, what percentages of people will answer uh, A, B, or C in other parts of the country. Um, at near the end of the hour, you get um, texts which actually ask you to kind of, um, to text in a, an idea that you have for improving mental health in your community or something you think is working in your school or your, or your community. So those two, once you get, once you text in those answers, get to go to a kind of a, a, a link that takes you to a page which shows you all the other ideas that everyone else has texted as well. So it's kind of an unusual thing and it's a try, an attempt to kind of combine some of the strengths of kind of the thick forms of public participation uh, that, that are mainly face-to-face, -face, uh, that are facilitated, um, that are uh, very meaningful, often very difficult to organize with some of the strengths of kind of thin, thinner forms of participation, more online, more viral, more adaptable. Um, and so I think this, these types of experiments, no matter how this works tomorrow, these types of experiments are kind of worth kind of pushing on when it comes to doing better participation. But I, 
think this is great, and I hope that it is a success tomorrow, um, but it's not really an example of civic infrastructure unless it becomes something that a community or a country does on a more kind of ongoing basis. And I think that's the kind of the biggest need in this type of work, is to think about not just how a temporary basis, how do we kind of engage people in something, but how do we kind of make that more the way that communities work. So here's one definition of civic infrastructure. Um, and it's a pretty broad one, basically saying kind of the, it's the, the regular opportunities, activities, and arenas that allow people to connect with each other, solve problems, make decisions, and be part of it. That's a very holistic question, and I think each community has to come up with its own definition, its own flavor of what this looks like and how they want to define it. Uh, but, but I think it's important that, that kind of it's, it's a broad sort of... What we have right now in most places is a whole lot of examples of weak civic infrastructure. <laughs> um, you know, certainly there are lots of cool uh, um, successes and things that we can model, and I'll talk about a, a few of those in, in, in a minute. But in general, especially in the U.S., we have pretty weak forms of civic infrastructure, and this, I think, is the weakest. <laughs> this is your standard public meeting, uh, and we're talking school boards, planning and zoning, city council, uh, federal agency hearings, pretty much any public meeting you want to name. Almost all of them work by this process where people get three minutes at an open microphone to state their frustrations with their elected officials, and they all go home frustrated including the elected officials. <laughs> um, this is the main way we do things, and um, it's supported to some extent by a legal framework, which doesn't usually um, mandate it, sometimes not always, uh, but it certainly encourages it, and it, it discourages innovation. We'll talk more about that in a second. Another kind of aspect of weak civic infrastructure is much more grassroots kinds of things. Uh, if we think about kind of the ground floor of democracy, I think, what, you know, a typical type of organization we'd be thinking about are neighborhood associations or PTAs or you know, clubs or things like that that are you know, relatively easy for people to get involved in. And yet most of them don't work very well. <laughs> um, mainly because most, well, for a bunch of reasons, one of which is they have pretty poor processes and they are, um, tend to be dominated by a small set of people who are more vocal than the rest who don't necessarily know how or that they ought to engage a much broader cross-section their neighbors, of, of other parents in that school, or those kinds of things. So I think there's a lot of renovation that needs to happen at that level. Uh, you could also talk about public space and physical environment, and the fact that most, well, a lot of places really lack kind of welcoming, uh, wired, um, good uh, hubs for people to, to come to physically to be, to be citizens. There's also the kind of the problem we have in that, that most of the public problems we, we try to, to tackle, the way in which we deal with them is through silos. Um, and, and this is just kind of one example of what the silos might look like. But, but essentially, most city halls, most state agencies, they have these kind of very vertical uh, structures. So it's very difficult to kind of uh, cross these boundaries. And, and as a, a citizen who wants to get involved in something, it's very difficult in the sense that you have to go to a separate meeting or a separate website or talk to a separate person about land use issues uh, versus environmental issues versus school issues. It's all kind of, you know, up to you to kind of figure out which silo you have to go to and then, you know, climb the rungs rather than having a range of issues, which usually are, they usually are quite related to one another, and yet it's not the way that the governments are structured. A friend of mine who's a city manager in Wisconsin says that, in fact, silos, uh, grain silos, are quite well networked. So we've actually been, you know, criticizing <laughs> silos unfairly all these years. <laughs> but it's still a good image. So, why does this matter? Um, and it, why it matters in a bunch of different ways. One is that because of the poor civic infrastructure and the lack of opportunities for people to connect with one another, to participate in decision, decision making, what we've got are a whole lot of uh, bridges which have decayed. We, we have um, uh, divisions within communities uh, between people of different backgrounds, different political affiliations. We certainly have divisions as a country. And what part of what has happened is that compromise is now incredibly difficult because of these new attitudes that citizens have toward their elected officials. They're more frustrated, more adamant. It's much more difficult, I think, than ever before for your average member of con uh, Congress, your average alderman, 
to actually compromise with his or her peers, partly because he or she knows that when they go back home or go to the next meeting in their ward, that people are going to be more frustrated, more adamant than ever before. So the, the, the art of compromise, and there's all kinds of other factors, this is a big question, there's all kinds of other factors here, like the fact that we've kind of sorted ourselves um, in, in terms of income and race and other kinds of variables, much more than we ever have before. Um, but, the, but, but I think this kind of lack of this ability to compromise and the ability of people with different points of view to actually come together is a big part of the gridlock we see. So the flip side of that, of course, is that when we can kind of create situations where people of different backgrounds and different opinions and, and ideologies can actually kind of talk to each other and compromise with one another, we see lots of examples of that in good participation projects where it's actually not that hard. You know, within a day, people who are Republicans or Democrats or whatever can actually kind of look at what they have in common and figure out how they would balance the federal budget or how they would um, make some kind of contentious policy issue. They can do in a day what can't be done by Congress in a year. Another problem, of course, is we have in the, the, um, the kind of a, a, a symptom of weak civic infrastructure is we have people who are essentially on, on the sidelines in most situations. They are not contributing. They can't find easy ways to contribute to public problem solving um, on issues that they care about. Um, and so they're basically sitting back waiting for government or other institutions to actually um, do things and getting increasingly frustrated when they don't or can't. So the flip side of that, of course, is having, um, you know, as part of kind of stronger civic infrastructure, having more opportunities for people to actually do things themselves, to, to inform policy making, but also to figure out what they might do um, to kind of make an impact on the issue they care about. These are people in, um, I think in St. Paul, uh, doing uh, traffic calming uh, art on their intersections. <laughs> um, I think another uh, um, kind of symptom of weak civic infrastructure is the fact that because people have very little control over their physical environment, the way that their communities look, the way they look, the communities look ends up being kind of, you know, really, really kind of just based subject to, to, to to market forces um, and the kind of the lack of uh, ability of local officials and other kinds of people to compromise about comprehensive plans and other kinds of things. So I think that there's kind of a link here to be made between uh, giving people more control over their physical environment and kind of then producing environments that people like, um, that are friendly to them, that are, that are good physical spaces for them. And then finally, there is a link also in the research between kind of weak um, community attachment weak feelings of attachment toward the place where you live and economic growth and vitality in those communities. So it, it apparently is a causal link. So the people, you know, uh, the Knight Foundation kind of um, delved into this a lot with their Soul of the Community Research, which was a, which was a 26 city um, research project. But basically, it, it's not that people are more attached to wealthier places. It's that that attachment it drives the level of wealth, the level of uh, economic development in those places. So this is obviously kind of a more um, uh, tentative kind of connection because it's not quite clear exactly how you use this kind of work to drive development, but it does seem to be the case that where you can do it, where you can get people to feel more attached to their communities, that that in fact will be economically good in addition to being good in, in other kinds of ways. So um, there's a bunch of different oops, potential building blocks. And, and this is just kind of one version of what this could look like. And I think a key thing with civic infrastructure, as I was trying to say before, is you know each community, each city, each neighborhood has to kind of think about what it wants, you know, what kind of picture it wants to draw of that community, what kinds of assets it has already in place that can be built upon, what kinds of new things might be imitated from other places, and above all, how it all should be connected into some kind of plan, some kind of infrastructure, some kind of something. Um, so that these previously isolated things actually are actually working together better. So trying to kind of come up with some categories here, we have kind of spaces for citizens. That seems like an important piece of civic infrastructure. Um, skills and capacity in a variety of ways. And um, public decision making and problem solving. So spaces for citizens, um, and again, one could define this in many different ways, but I think of this as kind of the kinds of Things, spaces they have in their schools, in the neighborhoods, in workplaces perhaps, uh, and not just physical ones, the online spaces that people have, and whether those two sets of things are connected, 
Um, are there spaces which are really uh, intended for young people or are welcoming for young people? And then kind of to some of the questions about you know, physical spaces and, and whether those kinds of things exist in a community or a neighborhood. Here's an example of a good physical space. <laughs> Um, and, and so, uh, spaces for young people. Uh, some of the some of the best examples I think out there include kind of the youth councils, like uh, Hampton, Virginia's youth council is kind of one of the, the leaders in this. But there's a bunch of different youth councils. I think um, is it the Mikva Challenge in Chicago, which is another good one. Um, but there's other interesting and different examples of ways to kind of teach civic skills and leadership to young people, and, and also not just teach it, but I, mean, I think a key piece of this is in fact tapping into the leadership ability of young people. It's not just, you know, we're going to give you some skills so that in 10 years or 20 years you're going to be a leader. I think some of the most effective um, and exciting engagement efforts are ones which have young people as kind of the public face of them, who are actually people who are kind of compelling others to participate, which, which um, is really exciting. Uh, local online forums. This, this is the thing that may be kind of changing fastest. I mean, it seems like all of a sudden, just in the last five years or so, there's these things have kind of popped up everywhere. And in some cases, what we're talking about here is just an a email listserv of neighborhood residents, or maybe a Facebook group. Uh, in other cases, what you've got is uh, some more sophisticated thing, um, like a neighborhood online forum set up by eDemocracy.org, or uh, there's for profits now out there, uh, next door, uh, a bunch of different, different um, uh, kind of organizations kind of setting up these kind of very local or hyper-local kinds of platforms. Um, there's a lot of, you know, potential to this because it's, what you're doing there is, is at least potentially kind of connecting people in ways that are both convenient for them and easy for them, but also meaningful because you've got the possibility and often the, the actuality of a face-to-face -face relationship. These are people you're going to see in the soccer field or in the grocery store in addition to the convenience of having that kind of online, online connection. And they work best also uh, when they kind of combine not just the political stuff, but the kind of social and, and cultural stuff too. So you look at what people are saying in some of these kinds of things. You know, some of it is, you know, hey, did you hear what the school board said or, or how they voted on thus and such. But some of it is also, uh, you know, who knows a good plumber? Or, you know, who's got a canoe I can borrow? Or um, uh, a funny story I heard recently with a woman in Minneapolis who uh, was, uh, baking lasagna for a memorial service, realized she had eight trays of lasagna in one oven, and so she put an appeal out on the local, the neighborhood online forum, and within two hours, she had seven other uh, neighbors who volunteered their oven, so all the lasagna got baked. So you know, when these kinds of things have that type of utility, this kind of personal utility, as well as kind of the political power um, and the social aspect, who's coming to the neighborhood barbecue, that that's, that's a really powerful mix. And we need to be thinking about civic infrastructure in that kind of variety of ways, not simply kind of the, the political ways. Uh, so skills capacity. Um, you know, the, the basic thing about kind of how information is being disseminated and circulated in the community. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening as far as media uh, and, and how kind of the media landscape is changing um, and, and kind of um, circulating information in very different ways than they did before the skills and, and, and um, capacities of, of not only of kind of the government staff or the kinds of organizational staff, but also people themselves, or, you know, and, and then also kind of ways to kind of track and measure some of this kind of stuff. Um, I think one of the most basic skills and one of the oldest um, is still this question of how do you get people to the table? How do you figure out who's in the community, the jurisdiction you're talking about, what kinds of networks they belong to, how can I tap into those networks to bring those kinds of people to the table? And, and who are the people who are least likely to come? And how do I kind of tap into them so that I build this web of relationships, of trust, um, so that people are going to be coming out because somebody they already know and trust has actually asked them to come out. Or, or I mean, if you come, you know, come out to the meeting on Tuesday, it could also be, you know, come to the website or, or do something or, or text and text talk and that. It's that, that same kind of fundamental thing, which is a very old part of public participation, which has been sped up a little bit, of course, by the online technologies, but it's still kind of a basic kind of fundamental of this kind of work, and I doubt that that's going to change. Um, then you kind of all the different kinds of skills that go into engagement itself, you know, facilitation, uh, framing issues, um, you know, uh, designing meetings, all those different kinds of things. 
this, there are very, this is a picture of one uh, community, and this is actually in Western Australia. They're doing a large scale process. And then other kinds of ways that you can kind of tap into capacity or encourage people, uh, like mini grants. Uh, you know, a bunch of cities have mini grant programs where you can kind of give people a pretty small amount of money, um, which they then combine with their own sweat equity, other resources that they can bring to the table, other money that they raise to do some pretty cool things. And this is a fun example from Seattle, uh, where they had, they had one of the first uh, mini grant programs going back 20 years. Um, and in this uh, neighborhood in Seattle, in Fremont, uh, people talked about this highway uh, overpass, which was kind of a scary part of the neighborhood. You know, people were dealing drugs here. This was not, you know, a, this was a problem spot for the, for the community. And so they got this mini grant from the city to do something about this, and they built a troll. So, yeah, things like this which kind of tap into and encourage people's, you know, creativity and their willingness to build something. Um, and by the way, that is a full-size VW Beetle Hulk, so you get a sense of the size of this thing. <laughs> and this is not a tourist attraction in this neighborhood. <laughs> um, so, so that those kinds of ways that you can use money, often in very small increments, to kind of to, to add to people's capacity. And then, how do you measure? I mean, you know, this, and this is, of course, a kind of a a tricky thing in the sense that so much of what we are talking about when we're talking about engagement and civic infrastructure seems unquantifiable. Um, but there are things that are quantifiable. Um, and you can kind of add the, the kind of the, the, the two kinds of data in ways that, that are interesting and allow people to kind of monitor what's going on and to analyze what's happening in their community. Why are people on this side of town less likely to turn for turnout meetings? You know, why is it that uh, you know the services over here are better than, than those over there? Um, and the San Diego Community Foundation is doing a cool thing now where they're developing kind of a set of indicators like this, which when put together basically add up to um, what they think of as a, a lead certification for local governments. So kind of like the lead uh, you know, for um, you know for buildings, kind of environmentally friendly green buildings. So they're trying to kind of have this um, way in which you know governments can kind of both measure and then also celebrate the fact that they're being successful as far as um, kind of engaging the public and kind of strengthening civic infrastructure. And then the last category here, which I put last partly because it's often the one we think of first, people at least who come, come from the participation of public engagement angle, um, but it's certainly important, um, you know, figuring out how to make public meetings have more innovative, more participatory, um, more effective than the typical three minutes in a microphone how do you do it in a more recurring, ongoing sort of way? So PB is clearly the shining example, uh, participatory budgeting is, is, is uh, a shining example of this, where you've got a deliberative process, but one that from the beginning is intended to be an ongoing annual deal, uh, and that can therefore kind of strengthen itself and get bigger and better over time. It may go through ups and downs, but if you look at some of the earliest PB processes in Latin America over 20 years, they really have built up into a huge, very high levels of participation, very high levels of equity in terms of the types of people who participate. Um, and then there's all kinds of other ways, uh, lots of technical ways that you can be encouraging innovation by citizens uh, and creating kind of self, uh, problem solving teams um, between citizens and public uh, uh, institutions. One uh, piece that may be helpful, and we had a, a session earlier this year um, talking about it here that Janice Thompson put together, um, and, and it was hosted by us. Uh, Yes, sitting at CAC, um, is about kind of this new uh, model ordinance for participation that was developed over the last year or so uh, by this coalition of groups, including ICMA and National Cities and um, ABA and the City Attorneys Group. And essentially what it does is kind of give um, more leeway for city councils, if they adopt something like this, to kind of engage the public in different ways than they do now. It's, it's basically modeled on the dispute resolution legislation that got passed uh, 20 years ago, which didn't, didn't require anything. It's not saying you must participate in this, this particular kind of way. It's basically just saying, if you choose to innovate, here are the principles you ought to follow. Here's some kind of you know guidelines you might want to, to consider. But basically, you, know, you are free to go and, and think about and try different ways of interacting with the public, not just the standard, tired, old, three minutes on a microphone type of deal. And then I think also, you know, when, as I said before, is you know, um, even when you're thinking about kind of the, the new forms of public meetings, official public meetings, what you ought to always think about kind of how are they going to be fun? What can we connect them with? What can we piggyback on that's going to make them not just uh, meaningful and powerful politically, but also enjoyable? So I love the quote that Gloria Rubio Cortez um, 
gave a few years ago, sometimes you need a meeting that's also a party, sometimes you need a party that's also a meeting. <laughs> so I'll, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here a, a second. Um, and, and Joe is going to kind of take us through, Joe and Maria, I think, a kind of more of a conversation here about kind of what this might mean for you all, what this might mean, what kinds of things you might be thinking about in Chicago. But I think in general, you know, um, asking the question of, kind of, you know, this is a very kind of holistic picture. Uh, and that also makes it intimidating as well as exciting. So I think a step here is to think about well, who else might have a stake in strengthening civic infrastructure in this community? What Are there community foundations? Are there other kinds of funders that have a particular interest in kind of the long-term health and success uh, of, of kind of the civic life in the community? Uh, what do the governments, uh, the local governments and other kinds of uh, public institutions, what, who among them have, has a real stake in this? Are there leaders there we can be working with? Um, are there nonprofit organizations? What other kinds of sets of people in the community who would be interested in this kind of question? Um, how to make the case to them, describe it to them, and how to kind of approach the whole planning process. Um, this, this NLC guy that Joe mentioned earlier is, is a guide for that. It's, it's kind of has sample agendas and things like that for doing that kind of planning in communities. So um, before I go to Joe's questions here, um, just want to open up for questions and comments. Uh, this is my favorite cartoon. It says, uh, the king seeks uh, public input for community planning. First meeting to be held in the dungeon. <laughs> so, emblematic of the type of participation we want to move